I think in one of the last um, sessions that we had, we were listening to uh, a production of a really beautifully done Qawwali from Coke Studio in, in Pakistan, something that was done quite professionally and with professional musicians. Um, there's a beauty and elegance to that. And there's also something really lovely about simply being in a person's very modest home and uh, being crammed in there with uh, 30 of your new closest friends and having a chance to, to listen to this kind of sacred um, performance. So let us begin now that you've had a little bit of a feast for the um, ear or hearing. Let's um, show you a couple of beautiful images that um, come to us from the artistic tradition in Islam. Uh, and these are the ways that medieval Muslims about seven, 800 years ago, imagined uh, Hazrat Adam and Hazrat Hava, Adam and Eve, uh, in a celestial garden setting. Uh, you see them seated the way that people still do in many settings in Iran, in Pakistan and India, in Turkey, on these raised beds, a taht, literally a throne. Uh, they're seated in this garden setting with flowers and blossoms and being tended to by, um, by a whole host of beautiful angelic uh, presences. Uh, you see that the, the way that Adam and Eve are presented is very much in that classical pose of a lover and a beloved. And we're gonna indeed come back to that of how Adam and Eve are presented in Islam as the original lovers in, in quest for one another. I'll show you a couple of other quick images. Um, this one uh, shows both of them with that halo of light around their head, indicating that they are both um, sacred and illuminated beings uh, standing under a tree, a cosmic tree, uh, and surrounded by angels as well as their progeny. Um, in that typical Eastern style, each one of them is holding and taking the, in the fragrance of a rose or of a flower. Uh, and this is a scene that we're gonna talk about in just a second, which is of the angels bowing down to uh, humanity. When, um, when God creates humanity as the um, perfect embodiment of all the divine names, that even the angels bow down to, to humanity. And we'll talk about this in just a second. Um, in December, quite a few of us had the great joy of performing uh, Umrah by going on the sacred pilgrimage to the cities of uh, Mecca. And also we added Medina. We hope to go back inshallah if we're called this December. And when you go on Umrah, you oftentimes fly to the city of Jeddah. Jeddah means grandmother. And it's called Jeddah because historically, we are told that it is the city of Eve, the city of Hava. And until um, the Saudis destroyed that particular tomb, there was a shrine for Eve in Jeddah, uh, right up until about 100 years ago. And you see on the picture on the right, people entering the shrine. On the left, you get a sense that it was a long building, that the grave itself was enormously long. And I'm gonna show you one zoom out picture. So if you look on the right-hand side where you have the trees, that cluster of trees on one side. And on the left-hand side, you have that mosque with the dome. That entire space between the trees and the dome on the left, that was the long 
grave of Eve. Right? This was a reminder that they were giants. But giants not only in terms of height, but really giants in terms of the realm of the spirit. And to think that uh, up until just about 100 years ago, every single person who would have gone on a pilgrimage might have also stopped by to pay their respect to the Jadda, to the grandmother of us all, who would be Eve. So let's um, come back and talk a little bit about the way that the Quran uh, talks about the story of Adam and Eve. Some of you might be familiar with this story already, and I'll try to add some new elements, but I'm mindful of the fact that for some, this might be new. So the stories of all of the prophets in the Quran is always said in a way that is expected to be already familiar. Um, the, the prophet lived in an oral tradition, and the idea was that the stories of Jews and Christians would have been um, circulated. So people had already heard something about the stories of Adam and Eve. The Quran simply goes more into its symbolic meaning. And the main story of Adam and Eve in the Quran comes up in the second chapter, Surah Al-Bahara, around verse 30. So what I'll be doing in these sessions is to walk us through these verses and then to talk about the ways that the Sufis in particular, our mystic friends, have interpreted. Um, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, it starts with وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَتِهِ إِنِّي جَاءِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً Remember when your cherishing, sustaining Lord said to the angels, I am putting, I am placing on the earth a deputy, a khalifa. Um, and the angels, they don't question God's will so much because they are essentially there to carry out God's command, um, but they simply express their astonishment. Uh, celestial beings are not bound by time the way that we are. And so they look into the history of humanity and they see what we see. Uh, as we would say in the southern parts of the United States, they see a hot mess. And they ask Allah, why do you want to create something that is going to um, cause problems and shed blood? While you have us and we go around praising you all day and sanctifying you. Um, and God simply responds by saying, Inni alamu ma la ta'lamun. I know something that you don't, because I know something that you don't. Um, the Sufis have talked about a few aspects of this story. First of all, humanity is introduced as it is our destiny to be the Khalifa. It is our destiny to represent God on earth. And as we've talked about it from time to time, if we only walked around saying, I am the deputy of God on earth, I'm the deputy of God on earth, well, after a while, it might go to your head. And you might start to see yourself as in this very aggrandized way. Um, so to be human is to always soar with these two wings. On one hand, there's the wing of majesty, the wing of dignity the wing of soaring as the representative of God. That's represented by the posture of prayer where you stand straight. In that initial posture of standing, your body resembles the number one, the letter Aleph. And in that posture, you represent the deputy 
of God towards creation. But then as the prayers progress, you bow down and you prostrate yourself by taking that which you usually hold up high and bringing it back to the earth, the very earth from which you're created. That's humility. That's surrender. And to be the deputy of God, to be the Khalifa of God, has to be balanced with this notion of being the devotee of God, the servant of God. A lot of the commentators love the fact that God does not say, someday in the distant future, I will put a Khalifa on earth. In Arabic, I am putting. God is constantly putting. This is what Ibn Arabi called al um, jadid a new creation. God is perpetually involved. Right? This is not the God of the deists that winds up a clock and steps back from history. In every breath, God is recreating the world fresh and recreating you fresh. And also, when the angels are like looking into the future and they say, why do you want to do this when um, this thing is going to cause problems and shed blood? Notice the response of God. God doesn't say, oh, you're wrong. It'll all be fine. There will be no problems. Mischief, what mischief? Blood, what blood? Uh, the, the divine answer is simply, because I know something that you don't. Keep that point in mind, because we're going to come back to that notion. Um, many Sufis, as early as one named uh, Neshapuri, they have said that the whole of the spiritual path, the whole of the Sufi path is about adab. It's about refinement. It's about a selfless, loving manners. Um, not manners in the sense of formality, but manners in the sense of how are we in relation to others. Um, so we're going to come back and talk about the way that this verse relates to the adab, the manners of angels, the manners, as we will see in a second, of Satan, and indeed the manners of Allah. Uh, the next ayah, وَأَلَّمَ adam al asma kullaha. This sounds really familiar. And God teaches Adam, so Adam is now named the human, the earth creature. That's the literal meaning of Adam. Um, it comes from the word Adima in Arabic, which is the surface layer of the earth. Adam, Adim. It's the same way in Hebrew. Adam, Adama, and Adama is the earthish creature, the soil creature, the dust creature. Um, so think about Adam as being both uh, a proper noun, it's the name of Hazrat Adam, but it's also that generic notion of that human who is somehow intimately related to the earth. And the very first notion that we get about the human creature is that we are taught by God. Before we are told anything about how we are made, of what we are made, what that process looks like, and God teaches the earth creature, the names all the names all 
And then here is a curious Arabic construction. Then God presents them to the angels. And tells Adam, tell them the names, if you are truthful. Excuse me, God tells the angels, name them if you are truthful. And the angels say, we only know the things that you've taught us. Um, you are the one that has all the knowledge. And then God has the earth creature, the Adam, name the names. Uh, it's, it's, an, it's a strange passage. And if you know the Bible, you're familiar with the biblical telling that God teaches humanity the names of all the creatures that crawl on the land and soar in the air and swim in the water. And sometimes there is a slightly problematic reading that by knowing the names of the creatures, humanity is given a certain amount of power and dominion over them. Well, some Quran commentators in the Muslim tradition also receive it that way, but not all. And that's what makes our Sufi friends so special. So I was curious what our dear friend Ibn Arabi would have to say about this. Uh, he has been with us so much when we were in Morocco. And Ibn Arabi does a close reading of this passage and he says, well, in the beginning, there is Allah and there are the angels and God creates the earth creature. And so the names relate to the names of these entities. And so he therefore says, the names refer to the names of Allah, the Asma al Husna, the beautiful names of God. And this is what he says God says in a hadith Qudsi, My earth and my heaven embrace me not, but the heart of my believing servant suffices me. It is as if God is saying, all of my names become manifest only within the human. So when he said that God taught Adam the names all, what is meant is the divine names from which all things in existence come into being. In other words, the notion that the angels are asked to recognize humanity, and indeed in the next verse, they're said to bow down to this earth creature, which they all do, except one named Iblis, in other words, Satan. For Ibn Arabi, this has everything to do with the fact that the human being, you, me, all of us, are actually designed by God to be the receptacle for the divine names. If we are to be the deputy of Allah on earth, if we are to represent God on earth, it is related to the measure in which we can embody these divine qualities. Uh, in the next verse, we get um, God asking the earth creature to name all of the names and then saying, did I not tell you that I know the secrets of heavens and the earth? قَالَ أَلَمْ أَقُلْ لَكُمْ إِنِّي أَعْلَمُ غَيْبِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Didn't I tell you that I know the secrets of heavens and the earth? And in the Sufi tradition, there's a beautiful way that that particular verse is interpreted. Um, and they say, God is the secret of humanity, and humanity is the secret of God. 
if you want to know God, you have to figure out what it is to be fully human, truly, beautifully human. And if you wish to know humanity, then you have to know God. Um, we have such a tendency in our tradition to our common American tradition to use expressions like, I'm only human, to err is human. Uh, that would be a strange statement for the sages of this tradition. Um, going back again to our friend uh, Ibn Arabi, at one point he has a vision of the throne of God. And he says that I saw the throne of God resting on a whole set of pillars, each one of which was flashing like a lightning. And then I noticed that there was a treasure under God's throne, and I looked and the treasure was the human. So you are the very treasure of Allah. This creature that oppresses and is lustful and is greedy, that is not the Khalifa, that is not the full human being. It might look like a human, but it's not living up to its destiny. So God has all the angels bow down. You saw that in the image that we showed. They all do so except for Iblis. And then all of a sudden, uh, the human is not one, but two. And if you have a feminist bone in your body, you will love this next verse of the Quran. And here's why. Of course, it's uh, pretty well known to most of you that um, within the biblical account, there is a dominant way in which the fall is usually attributed uh, to Eve. Eve is the one that who is tempted by the devil and she brings the message to Adam and uh, as a result, she is the one who bears the punishment. There's even some suggestions that um, childbirth and pregnancy are part of this punishment for, for the fall. Uh, well, there are some Muslim commentators, especially those who came from Jewish and Christian backgrounds, who translate those biblical accounts verbatim into their commentaries. But it is a little bit of a relief indeed, to read what the Quran itself actually says, which is quite different. In the Quran, God addresses Adam and Eve to live in serenity in the garden, to live in peace and tranquility in the garden. And then pay attention to um, the close reading of the verse. And I'm going to translate this for you literally. Then did Satan make the two of them. This is in the dual in Arabic. Then Satan made the two of them slip from the garden, and it got the two of them out of the state of serenity that they had been in. And so we said to them, get out. In other words, uh, in the Quranic reading, there is um, the sense that this tendency towards forgetfulness of forgetting God's command is something that is equally shared by Adam and Eve. And perhaps more interestingly, more importantly, uh, then God immediately teaches the human words of repentance, uh, words of tauba. And repentance, a fancy word, but it literally means turn again, turn your face again, 
when you're mad at each other and you turn your back and I'm not going to look at you because I'm mad at you. And repentance is when you return, you square your shoulders with someone and you look eye to eye with them. And what's perhaps more extraordinary is that the initiator of repentance in the Quran is God himself. So God teaches the human words and God turns towards the human because God is the one who is most forgiving, most compassionate. فَتَلَقَّى آدَم مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلَمَاتِ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ تَوَّابٌ رحيم. God is the tawwab. God is the one who begins repentance, initiates repentance. Um, in one of the beautiful Sufi commentaries that we have, uh, Adam is weeping at having disappointed God, and he goes to Gabriel and says, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed before God. Um, and the comfort that Jibreel offers him is uh, your cherishing, sustaining Lord is the nearest of the near. The nearest of the near. So every religious tradition has its own fragrance. Um, certainly there's no reason to deny the commonality of wisdom, of beauty, of truth that we experience in all of them. Um, but you also don't want to take all the different paths and put them in a blender and mix them together. Uh, just as you wouldn't want to take Indian food and Thai food and French food and Mexican food and put it in a blender. Uh, the result might be slightly less than satisfying. Um, so what's interesting is that within the uh, Islamic universe, there's no um, suggestion of something that we could think of as an original sin. Thus, there's no need for um, that redemptive sacrifice that perhaps one would expect in the Christian tradition. But there is perhaps a tendency to forget. Now, we keep forgetting what we're supposed to be. We keep forgetting that we are um, somehow a representative of God on earth. And of course, the remedy, the antidote, is nothing other than remembrance. Uh, so the passage ends by stating, uh, and if, as is sure, there comes to you guidance from me, right? This is one of those me passages in the Quran. Anytime that God speaks in an I or me voice, those are the extraordinarily intimate verses. And if, as is sure, there comes to you guidance from me, Whoever follows my guidance, on them there is no fear, nor shall they grieve. Um, the way that uh, the tradition develops this is that Adam and Eve are separated. Uh, our Desi friends will be quite happy with this. Adam is sent down to India. Sometimes we're told Sri Lanka, sometimes we're told uh, India, Pakistan, South Asia, uh, and Eve is sent to Jeddah in Arabia. And the two of them seek each other, and where should they meet but at the Kaaba? So the Kaaba is described as the first abode of love, the first place of union, the first place of reunion. Um, and in the Sufi sources, this is what we get. Um, this is God addressing Adam. I will join Eve to you in the retreat of my house, the Kaaba, which I shall make the great Qibla, the great direction of prayer, 
the Qibla of the Prophet, who will be the greatest source of honor for you. And then look at how reciprocal this passage is stated. I know what you feel in your heart for Eve, and I know what she feels in her heart for you. So when you see her, live in kindness with her, for I have destined her to be the mother of boys and girls. I want to um, start wrapping up so that we can have time for our breakout groups um, by adding some insights from the Sufi tradition about how Adam and Eve are said to have been created. Um, again, you know that uh, in the biblical account, you have a passage that Eve is created from Adam, uh, created from a rib. And um, I think we have all probably heard a little bit too much about the notion of Eve was made from a crooked rib, a bent rib, and that's why you can't straighten out women. And there's a whole lot of patriarchy and misogyny that has come out of that. Again, that biblical account is translated by um, Jewish and Christian converts to Islam, even though it's not named in the Quran. But there is a beautiful passage, an extraordinary passage, that one wonders what it would be like to base one's understanding of men and women upon this passage instead. Uh, so this is the very first verse of the fourth chapter of the Quran, interestingly enough, called the chapter on women. Um, ya ayyuhan nas, O humanity, attaqu rabbakum. Um, be mindful of your sustaining Lord, alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidatin, who created you from a singular soul, feminine. Min nafsin wahidatin, a God who created be in awe of your God, of your Lord, who created all of humanity from one singular feminine soul, and from that one created her partner. Okay, now we got something to work with here. The literal aspect of this verse would seem to be that rather than God creating Adam, and then from Adam creating Eve, God creates the human soul, and from that human soul, God creates the pair, right? It's actually pretty extraordinary that more reflection on this verse has not been done so far. Um, but I mentioned that as one of these possibilities that there is uh, in the Quran itself. The account that we're familiar with, that many of us have heard, is of course that uh, Adam, the human, is made from earth. And then the breath of Allah is breathed into us. Um, there's a wonderful account in the 12th century Sufi, Ain al uh, who says that God spent 70,000 years love glancing on the earth until the earth became worthy, capable of receiving the divine spirit. Um, and since we are speaking about Adam and Eve, men and women, the original lover and beloved, 
uh, I want to end by sharing a few passages from what Ibn Arabi says about the spiritual rank of women. Uh, and he ties this specifically to all the people who have suggested that women are somehow inferior, women are somehow derivative, that they do not have the same worthiness spiritually, intellectually, physically. Um, and I want to read these passages just so you have a sense of how clear and unequivocal of an Arabi is. Um, so this is what he says in his notion of the insan al-kamil, the fully mature, fully realized, complete human being. He says, um, perfection is not barred to women. The notion of the fully realized human being is both for males and females. All of the universal ranks of illumination and all of the activities of the inner realm are open to both men and women. Men and women are siblings. All that is rightfully a man's in terms of stations, degrees, and qualities is also fully possible for women as God wills. And then he says, um, when people suggest to him that no, it's uh, men have a degree of preference over women, uh, this is his response. Uh, and this is his friendly little jab pointing at women's superiority, perhaps. And he says, had there been no honor paid to women, other than the fact that the divine essence, the that, and the divine attributes, the safat, are feminine, that would have been enough. Right? Uh, the word for the divine essence, feminine. The word for the divine qualities and attributes, feminine. The word for the Islamic code of life, sharia, feminine, the word for the Sufi path, tariqa, feminine. Um, and Ibn Arabi says, if it had just been that the divine essence and divine attributes um, are both feminine, that would have, that would have been, been enough. Um, anyway, so we have uh, taken some, some time. Let me um, end this part and open us up for um, our, our discussion with one last notion that I hinted at in the beginning and we didn't get to complete it, which was that notion of adab, that notion of uh, refinement, of beautiful, elegant manners. Um, so the Sufis have oftentimes said that there are three adabs in this passage. God is about to create and keep creating the human, the angels respond by saying, why do you want to do such a thing when um, we see that um, we see that this thing is going to shed problems? And um, then God says, because I know something that you don't. So some Sufis have oftentimes said that this is because uh, what we have is three types of adab. The adab of 
um, shaitan, the adab of the devil, if you would, is to look at someone and to say that I'm better than this. So if you look at someone and your very first impulse is to assert your superiority, I'm more eloquent, I'm more spiritual, I'm of a better stock, I follow a better teacher. If your first impulse at encountering someone is to say, I'm better than this, well then, you know, congratulations. You're following the adab of the devil. If on the other hand, you follow a, a background in which you see someone and uh, you, your impulse, your inclination is to say something like, mm, you know, I worry that something could go wrong. Like, seems like a nice person, but what if something goes wrong? Um, then you have the adept of angels. It doesn't mean that you are wrong. Something may, in fact, go wrong. But if that's the primary place that you start from and you end with, well, then, you know, you have the adab of angels, which is not wrong, but perhaps incomplete, insufficient. So what could be better? The adab of Allah. And what is the adab of Allah? is when you recognize that yes something could go wrong but you actively choose to become involved in bringing out the qualities of goodness and beauty that's the adab of allah the adab of allah is where you're not simply going to be a bystander but you choose to become involved, engaged, caring, working within that. Um, so think about these stories as really being involved in some capacity as setting out ideal types and how do we relate to them? How is it that our own practice may um, give an indication of how it is that we are relating to other people? Um, there's certainly the need to also practice care, wisdom, um, something may go wrong and maybe looking out for what could go wrong could be a kind of necessary protection but maybe that shouldn't be the last word and the final word all right so i'm going to open up the um the breakout rooms particularly if this is the first time that you are joining us um, i'll mention the um, the instruction that we give every single time on these on these sessions, this is an opportunity to share. It's an opportunity to reflect. No one is in these breakout rooms as a guru, as a guide, as a sheikh. Um, we're all here together to be together, to learn together, um, and to be with one another. So. If you notice that someone has maybe just gone on for too long without pausing, um, then feel free to just say, thank you. Thank you. Um, I suggest that each of us takes maybe about a minute or so in the beginning um, to share some thoughts and reflections, uh, and then we'll come back together in about 15 minutes, inshallah. So I'm opening up the rooms and uh, we'll see you inshallah in just a few minutes.